There have been a lot of people who have lived in the White House since it was built, but also a lot of people have died too. Join us as we have a look at the people who have passed away inside the White House. President William Henry Harrison America's ninth president might be relatively unknown to some, but that doesn't mean he didn't set some records while he was in the office. Born in 1773, Harrison became president in 1841 at the age of just 60 years old. He would die in the White House just 31 days later, making him both the first president to die in office and the shortest one to serve. But why did William Henry Harrison die? Maybe it was his one hour and 45 minute long inaugural address, which also happens to be the longest one in the history of America. It's commonly believed that he caught pneumonia while delivering this lengthy speech and that that was the reason why he ended up passing away. However, a second theory would suggest that Harrison died from intestinal fever, which he might have contracted from the White House's tainted water supply, which actually comes in from the Potomac River. And if it is all true, William Henry Harrison wouldn't be the first person to fall victim to Washington's dirty water either, since it's also been suggested that this dirty water was the cause of death for two other American presidents as well. Willie Lincoln Speaking of tainted water supplies, it's also been suggested that tainted water may have also claimed the life of William Wallace Lincoln, Abraham and Mary Lincoln's third son. Now, Willie had been known to be a little bit of a mischievous child before moving into the White House with his parents in 1861, and in fact, he and his little brother Tad were actually known as notorious hellions by some of the staff for the knack of overturning any room or office that they were unleashed into. So perhaps it may have been surprising when, in early 1862, Tad and Willie both became sick with typhoid fever. And while Tad did seem to get better, Willie's fever kept fluctuating until it finally worsened. He would pass away in his bedroom on February 20th of 1862 at the young age of just 11 years old. President Zachary Taylor Jumping back to presidents for a few moments, we talk about America's 12th president, Zachary Taylor. President Taylor would be elected into office in March of 1849 and served as president until the day he died on July 9th of 1950. Now, there are many theories as to why Taylor may have passed away, but a few things are certain. Like how Taylor, after enjoying a large quantity of cherries and iced milk during Independence Day festivities, then decided to wash it all down with several glasses of water. Passing away five days later after suffering from stomach cramps, diarrhea, and dehydration. And while it's only been suggested that Taylor fell victim to Washington's contaminated water supply, it's obvious that he must have suffered from one of the more crappier deaths in American history. Caroline Harrison First Lady Caroline Harrison was the wife to our 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, who also happened to be the grandson of William Henry Harrison. Curse anyone? Carolyn was very active during her tenure as First Lady. For one, she oversaw many of the renovations that took place on the White House grounds during the time. Caroline also introduced the tradition of having a Christmas tree in the White House in 1889 and even helped to rid the place of rodents in order to make it more sanitary. But by 1891, Caroline would be diagnosed with tuberculosis. Despite the fact she did try to follow through with her social obligations as much as possible, but then her condition would come to worsen and she would finally become bedridden. On October 25th of 1892, Caroline died at the age of 60 years old. Charles G. Ross An accomplished Pulitzer Prize winner and press secretary to President Harry S. Truman, Charles G. Ross was from Missouri and, in 1908, would become the first professor at the newly formed Missouri School of Journalism. During his slow rise to the top, Ross won a Pulitzer Prize in 1932 for an article he wrote titled The Country's Plight, What Can Be Done About It? about the looming Great Depression. Two years later, in 1934, Truman would ask Ross to become his press secretary, an offer that Ross of course accepted. He must have loved his job though, because he died at his desk on December 5th of 1950 after giving one press conference and preparing to make some comments for the news. Letitia Christian Tyler 
Next, we have another first lady, Zachary Taylor's first wife, Letitia Christian Tyler. Letitia first met Zachary in 1808 when he was still a law student. Unlike Caroline Harrison, however, Letitia was a little bit more of a recluse. She preferred to stay at home as a domestic housewife instead of being in the limelight as the wife of a politician like so many of her contemporaries. In 1939, Letitia would suffer from a stroke which left her paralyzed and by the time that she had moved to Washington as First Lady, she opted to remain on the second floor of the executive mansion, only coming downstairs one time to witness her daughter's wedding. She finally passed away peacefully after having a second stroke on September 10th of 1842. Yet another First Lady, Ellen Wilson first met future President Woodrow Wilson in April of 1883 while house-sitting for her widowed father. Woodrow was immediately taken by her, and they married just six months later. Ellen apparently enjoyed the fine arts. She liked listening to music and also liked to draw pictures during her free time. She even personally planned two of her daughter's weddings. Then, sometime in 1914, Ellen tripped and fell while walking around in the White House. While the accident itself wasn't very serious, her physicians soon discovered that she was suffering from the latter stages of Bright's disease. Despite the matter, however, neither she nor her physician decided to tell the president, and instead decided to inform him just two days before her death. She would eventually pass away peacefully on August 6th of 1914, at just the age of 54. Margaret Wallace Harry Truman's mother-in-law was always critical of her son-in-law and wasn't exactly afraid to criticize him publicly. Even when Truman became president after FDR, Wallace continued to act like her daughter didn't deserve this up-jumped farmer for a husband, going so far as to question many of his political decisions both in private and the public eye. Truman, however, never seemed to really care about these slights. In fact, when Wallace finally did pass away on December 5th of 1952, Truman noted that she was a grand lady, and when he hears mother-in-law jokes, he doesn't laugh. I don't know about Truman, but with a mother-in-law like Wallace, I'd breathe a little sigh of relief. Elisha Hunt Allen Born in 1804, Elisha Hunt Allen was a congressman, lawyer, and diplomat. He also happened to be the minister from the then Kingdom of Hawaii at the time and served under eight presidents total. He seemed to be doing well for himself, with an estate in Hawaii and several diplomatic and legislative positions under his belt during his political career. That is until the year of 1877, when his Hawaii plantation would begin to fail and he began to lose money. Things did eventually begin to look up for Allen five years later, and then by 1882, Allen had been able to begin paying dividends for the plantation again. It was too bad, however, that he didn't live long enough to enjoy the change in his fortune. Elisha Hunt Allen would find his end at a New Year's Day diplomatic ball on January 1st of 1883. The cause of death? Heart attack. Frederick Dent Frederick Dent was the father of Julia Dent Grant, who was the wife of our 18th president, Ulysses S. Grant, and Frederick would eventually be able to become a merchant, as well as a slaveholding plantation owner with a total of 30 slaves. Finally, when the Civil War did roll around, Dent refused to free his slaves until he was then forced by the law of the Emancipation Proclamation. Dent did move into the White House when Grant became the president in 1869, and he'd eventually die there on December 16th of 1873 at the age of 88. A Presidential Funeral now that we've talked about people dying in the White House, how about we top it all off by talking about exactly what happens when a president dies? You know, as if it couldn't get more morbid. The first presidential funeral was actually conducted in 1790 in honor of one of our favorite founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. It included a procession to Independence Hall and was attended by 20,000 mourners. Muffled bells rang to sound his demise, and ships hoisted up black flags in his memory. It wasn't until 1799 with the passing of George Washington that America witnessed its first presidential funeral. When the father of our country finally passed away, the whole nation mourned. Mock funerals and mock processions were held all over the nation. Even across the waves in Europe, the effects of Washington's death could be observed. When word got to Britain about Washington's passing, the entire Royal Navy was ordered to lower their flags to half-mast. 
and in France, Napoleon Bonaparte had a eulogy written for him. Washington's actual funeral was a much more simple affair, with a small procession as per Washington's wishes. It wasn't until the passing of William Henry Harrison that America saw its first state funeral, and even though it was a short-lived presidency, they went the whole nine yards, with an invite-only religious service, a horse carriage procession, and the Marine Corps band playing a mournful dirge in his honor. From then on out, the tradition of having a large state funeral would continue into the modern day. With the passing of Abraham Lincoln, America would hold its first lying in state ceremony for a president, letting the deceased president be observed in his casket by mourners in the Capitol Rotunda, before transporting him by train to his home state of Illinois. While there may be little changes here and there, it's still President Lincoln's funeral that we emulate when laying our presidents to rest. Meet Lance Corporal Kylie Watson. Watson is well known for her heroism and efforts to make sure that her fellow colleagues are safe at all times. We know being in combat is hard, but it takes an extraordinary person to put your life before others at every given moment. Here are a few quick facts about Watson. She was only 23 years old and 5 feet tall when she joined the Army in 2006. 